Hi everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, whatever. I know it's the final session before lunch. Um, we'll try not to go too long, don't worry. So I want to talk a bit about official Docker images and what you can do or what you can struggle with. So uh, I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, Bits. And we do have our fair share of Docker images and we also have our fair share of pain around them. And this talk is a bit about that. So who uses Docker generally? I guess that's almost everybody by now. Who uses Docker in production? That's almost everybody. Who uses stateful images, like databases in Docker? That's far fewer, okay. Who uses our images? Okay, good. Um, who uses our stack but with other images, like by somebody else or their own? I'm always curious. Okay. If you do that, um, you can come to me afterwards. I'm always curious why that is. There's sometimes good or bad reasons for not using our images. Like we totally don't insist on you using ours, but sometimes there are good or bad reasons for that. So let's see. Um, internally, uh, we always say that Docker is kind of the world's most heavily funded college project because that's how stable their APIs normally are. I, I think just two weeks ago, they again broke something in a very unexpected way and yeah, it's always fun to work with Docker. And actually, I think the real Docker logo should be this one. Um, and you see, you we are all the little Nemo fish down there, and that is the big Docker that will eat us at some point. So that's the general idea of Docker, I think. So what I kind of want to dive into today is what even is official? Um, that's something that is very tricky, as you will see. Uh, base images, the release policies of how we push out stuff, um, security and stability of images, customization, and a bit of orchestration at the end. So if you head over to Docker Hub, it will normally tell you that the images there are official. So, well, official is always interesting. Um, what do you get if you pull these images? Or if you do that, Docker pull, Elasticsearch, whatever version number. Uh, same for Kibana and Logstash. Those are official. What does that mean? Any guesses? Is that from us? Is that from Docker? Is that from somebody else? Yeah, the problem is it just got more complicated again because initially the Elasticsearch image was from Docker Inc. So Elastic, the company building the other product, was not in involved in that. So Docker Inc. built those images and provided them. And they were marked as official because they were official by Docker Inc. That was the official one. We didn't like those images too much and we also didn't like the way they were built, so we had them deprecated. Um, so at some point there were no more updates to these images. And one and a half month or so ago, we took over those images. And now depending on which version you're trying to get from Docker Hub, you will either get the old images built by Docker Inc. or you will get the newer images built by us. So unfortunately, it is very confusing now um, because right now we are replicating our own images that we built into Docker Hub as well. And if you look at the page, this is, for example, a screenshot of the what you could get out of Docker Hub. You could see six, by now it's at 6.5.2 already. This is one that we built. Um, if you go to 5.6 or 12 or whatever you have right now, these are also from us. But if you go to 5, um, with Alpine, those are actually from Docker Inc. So you have a mix of images built by Docker Inc. and by Elastic Inc. So it's kind of a bit complicated of what you're getting. Um, and actually with the current images, what you do get is this. This is the source file behind this, which might be a bit hard to read, but you can see basically all we do to build those images is pull them from our own registry. So we have our own registry, and if you get the latest images, five, six, 652, that's the right version. Um, you will get basically from our own registry a specific pin and the ID. You can see this is, these are the images you will get from that. Um, why are we doing that? Why are we not building on Docker Hub like everybody else? Because, well, we, this is kind of the background information. You can read that. I'll leave it in the slides. It's mostly for the background information. It's mainly the way we build our images is we have like Python scripting around it to test and test the underlying image. For example, we do test like are we applying memory settings the way we expect them to be? Um, do we apply checks for file handles? Like how many file handles can you open with the images? 
And these tests have uncovered issues around the base image itself, the way we instrument Elasticsearch, and just how we build our images. So we find those tests very valuable. However, it doesn't really work the way that a general Docker file is being built. That's why, well, we cannot just create the Docker file and push it for to Docker Hub, but we're building those images ourselves with Python. And afterwards, we're pushing out the final image to Docker Hub. This is now possible, but it has only been possible for like two months or so. Um, and we do like to build our own tooling. Like we maybe have this not invented here syndrome as well. For example, to build our images by now, we recently introduced it. We have something called Teddy, the template engine for Docker. Um, this is our own tooling. Basically, we have our own templating engine, and then you define a YAML file, and it will build various kinds of images out of that. If you're just using the images, you don't care. If you want to take our images and customize them, you might run into this. And yeah, we like to build our own tooling. I'm sorry. Um, and we also do have our own registry. So if you want to get our files, um, docker.elastic.co, that is where our registry lives. and I really like this tweet that some people are confused or s always surprised why there are not more custom registries. And we totally agree, especially like two years ago or so, Docker Hub was not super stable. Like every now and then it was not available. And every now and then it was slow. And well, we didn't like that. Also, we are using Docker images for our own, our own cloud service um, in general. So we always needed our Docker images to be available and fast to download. So that's why we have our own Docker registry. So yeah. Also, besides speed and reliability, we do get very good download statistics. So if you use our registry, we will actually aggregate every night like how many people have downloaded version 6, 5, 2, and every other version. We know from which countries because we basically do a GOIP lookup. So we exactly know which images were downloaded and which version. And by now, the Docker downloads are a sizable amount of the total downloads that we have. I think we recently, did we break 250 million downloads of our products over everything? And I think currently, Docker is probably 20 or 30% of our downloads of um, everything. Um, so it is a good number. And we do get a lot of information out of that. So for example, we would know how many people from Ukraine have downloaded our version or our software yesterday. And then we would s know like, okay, this is where people are interested and this is where people are doing things. So we should invest more into these regions. Um, so there is good information in that. And you don't that get that from Docker Hub. Docker Hub has this label where it says this image was downloaded 10 million times, but you have no idea which specific version and you don't know from where. So it just misses out on information that we like to have. Um, if you want to see the front end, this is currently the front end. And unfortunately, this is also a bit confusing. Um, does anybody know how to see all the available versions wi within 6.4, how to get to them from that UI? Because we ha I have seen multiple people who struggle to find that. There is this, next to 6.4, there is this little arrow, this very yellow little arrow before the Docker pole. If you click that little arrow, it will actually unfold and show you all the available versions, um, which is a bit hidden. And if you click on 6.4, that the number itself, that one will take you to the documentation of 6.4 of Elasticsearch. Um, we will probably redo that UI soon because it is a bit confusing. It was a nice idea, but it's maybe too tricky. Um, but yeah, and this is available on www.docker.elastic.co. We don't have it under docker.elastic.co directly because it's kind of hard to determine if something is like curl trying to download uh, an image or if it's a user trying to see which versions are available and to not kind of like give you try to give you the image when you do a pull or show you the website. We just use different domains to make that distinction clearer. Okay, what are the problems around not using Docker Hub or why should you use Docker Hub? The first thing is some tools expect stuff to be on Docker Hub, like automated builds, Kitematic at least expected it for builds to be on Docker Hub. Um, our registry, I th I'm not sure if it now supports IP version 6, but for a long time uh, it did not support IP version 6, which also was downside for other people, but that was because the cloud provider we are using, uh, they at least in the past didn't support IP version 6 for everything, because maybe they are more of a bookstore than a cloud so service, whatever. Um, 
And the final thing, or the final problem that you have and that nobody here thinks about is the Great Firewall of China. That Docker Hub has a mirror in China, that's why you can use Docker Hub efficiently there. But if you're not on Docker Hub and you don't have that mirror in China, suddenly your downloads will be either super slow or they will not work at all. Um, and our naif naive assumption then would be that, oh, we just create a new uh, proxy or mirror in China and do that, right? Unfortunately, that's not that easy in China, because in China you need to have a legal entity in China, otherwise you cannot officially provide services for downloads and it's its own whole interesting ecosystem. It took us kind of a year, I think, to create a company in China, but by now we could have our own proxy, but, well, we don't need that anymore, um, because you can get our images from Docker Hub as well. So if you go to um, dockerhub.docker.com slash r slash elastic and then whatever product, then you can still get our images from Docker Hub, um, which, yeah, these are the right URLs. So we have all the products that we have. You can pull directly from Docker Hub as well from there. The Beats and APM are only on the R Elastic, um, whereas the other ones like Elasticsearch, Kibana, and Logstash are also like available on slash U um, or the underscore, um, where you can just do Elastic uh, Docker pull Elasticsearch directly. Um, okay, base images. Who cares about base images a lot? Anybody? Yeah, okay. So wh wh what are people using? Who is on Alpine? Yeah, who is right, like Debian, Ubuntu? Who is anything Red Hat based, CentOS, Fedora? Okay. The wild mix, okay. Um, yeah, this is what we also see. Like initially when we started with our own images at first, we used Alpine because, well, it's small and there was at least two years ago this trend that every everybody uses Alpine for their images. And it kind of worked. Um, however, we only had that for Elasticsearch, whereas for Logstash, Kibana, and Beats, we used Ubuntu. Uh, mainly because I think two years ago, Alpine didn't support Node officially. so. We couldn't really use Kibana there because it needs Node and we wanted official support. And I think, I'm not sure if JRuby, which is Logstash, is supported on Alpine as of now. But at least for a long time it was not supported. So we couldn't really use Alpine for that. And then in 5.4 we kind of standardized on the same base image for everybody. Um, so if you get images 5.4 or later, they're always based on CentOS 7. And this was kind of the pragmatic choice because I would say the most big customers that we have are in the US and their CentOS or anything Red Hat based is kind of the default. So that is what most customers that we have wanted. And that's why we have standardized on that. Uh, and here you can see kind of a few interesting things. So first off, you can see um, CentOS 7 is the base image that you will get when you get our images. Um, the next thing that is interesting um, there was this recent Java versioning or licensing discussion, like first off, we're using the GPL OpenJDK, and our images are right now at JDK 11 already. We do support in the latest version Java 8 and 11, but our Docker images will give you Java or JDK 11 already. So this is what you get here. And the final thing that you will run into later or that you need to know when you use our images is that we use the Elasticsearch user with a user ID of 1000 and if you bind mounted data directory that reads and writes or keeps that data you will need to keep the same permissions for those. That's why this is kind of also important information that you need to keep around. What is nice about this setup is that it's kind of the same for all the images now. One base image, one setup script. Like, we don't have to mix like Alpine installation instructions and Ubuntu installation instructions anymore. We can share the base layer. So since all our images are based on CentOS, you only need the base layer once, and then just like the different software pieces that we add are different. And for us, especially for Elasticsearch, the JDK is large anyway. And we always want the JDK because it brings more tools for debugging. So that's why we generally recommend to you to run Elasticsearch on the JDK and not just the JRE. And the JDK is large anyway. So you're, even if your image is super small, your base image, as soon as you add the JDK, it will not be super small anymore. So it's not really that much of a gain. Um, also, we had kind of a lot of is issues uh, with Alpine um, since, well, glibc might be old and not so nice, but it's super well tested. 
and established, whereas MuCL in Alpine, we always ran into issues with, or always, we ran into some issues with that. And it, those were normally issues that were very hard to debug because it was only like one specific host operating system or one specific file system, and only in that combination there was something that broke. Um, those issues, at least the ones we ran into, are fixed now, but we always had the feeling that with MuCL, um, we are running into more issues than we should and we kind of were a bit annoyed by that. Um, the main downside is that the size is much larger for those images. Who cares a lot about the size of the images? Okay, kind of, maybe. Um, for us it's like, it depends mainly. Maybe like here is the size and you can see uh, how the size changed over time. I put it in a table so it's a bit more readable. So you can see back when Elasticsearch was based on Alpine, it was a lot smaller and has kind of grown, but it's also a bit of an apples, uh, uh, or it's not really a fair comparison because we added a lot of stuff in those later versions. Um, you can see the Ubuntu images were never really small, so yeah, they have been growing, going up and down a bit in size. Um, maybe for Filebeat it would make sense to have a smaller image because that is what you will deploy many times. So what kind of for us is a thing, why are we not co too concerned with the size? Because if you have a stateless application that you deploy 20 times a day, then the image size will make a difference. If you have Elasticsearch, how many times are you deploying Elasticsearch? Or how many times are you changing it? I mean, we only release like a patch level release at most every two or four weeks or so. So you will not push out new images all the time. I get it's slightly annoying if you have on your developer machine large images because it will eat your expensive SSD locally. But for anything that you run in a production environment, you probably don't care about it that much for the stateful services. Like for databases especially, you probably have gigabytes or terabytes of data in Elasticsearch, then the image size doesn't really matter that much anymore. Whereas for stateless stuff, I totally get you want small images and you want to be able to push them out on a frequent basis. Um, and the next discussion we always have is what do you include in the Docker image? Since it's kind of the final build that you give people out, what do you even include in those builds? And again, we kind of tried to learn and adjust it a, a couple of times. So depending on what, what version you get, you might get totally different things from our images. The first one is, if you're getting the 5X images, you're always getting a platinum trial. You can pass some flags to disable any commercial features, but by default you will, would get a version that includes all the commercial things and a trial. In 6, or in 6.0 to 6.2, we have three base images. So we have three different images for every version that we build. There is the one that is basic, that is basically free to use, um, but not all this, the, so the code is open source. There is a pure open source code uh, image, and then there is a platinum trial image. And you basically need to pick the one you want. Um, then in 6.3 we change the code internally and now what we have is we have a basic image where you can optionally enable the trial once per major version or there is a pure open source image. So starting in 6.3 you only have two base images anymore to pick. The next thing is which plugins do you include or do you include any plugins? Does anybody know which plugins we are shipping with our Docker images, if any? We're including two. Um, so there are two ingest plugins, one for GOIP lookups and one for user agents. And that is because they are used by the beats when they collect information, they make often use of those. And it's kind of the startup experience we want to have to kind of have that easy going. But otherwise, if you want more plugins or anything, you will need to add those yourself and customize the images. Um, in the future, well, let's see what we will bring in the future. So the first thing that people often ask about are like, can we have multiple base images? Like we would have like something Debian based or we would like to have Alpine based images again. I'm not sure, maybe it makes sense mostly for Beats because those images will run on a lot of servers, whereas the central Elasticsearch images, I'm not sure like the base image makes such a big difference. Um, and one thing people ask for then is, can we have Windows images? Which we really don't want to do because very few of us are using Windows, but that kind of even makes sense. If you're on a Windows Server 2016 or later and you use a Windows base image, then you can get rid of that virtualization layer and you have direct system calls, which might make sense because, well, 
one layer of abstraction less for performance uh, and any compatibility issues. So we get that there might be a point in Windows images. We just really don't want to build them. And we'll see how we can work around that. Okay, release policy. Um, we don't have latest. Who is using latest? Who dares to raise their hand, basically? Um, so we don't, don't have latest because we think it's a really bad idea. And I always call them the zombies. The, the ideas that should have been killed a long time ago, but they kind of keep shambling along. Um, why is it especially for stateful stuff such a bad idea? The assumption is you spin up a small cluster with three nodes today. And that will give you 6.5.2. And in half a year, you want to add two more nodes. And both of them you have added with latest. So in half a year, you will maybe get version 7 already. So you might get a new major version. And there is a good chance that your cluster will not behave the way you want it when you mix major versions. Or at least you need to start migrating or make sure that everything is compatible. So you might break your cluster by adding at different points in time different images with latest. So that's why we don't support that. Because maybe it's a bit more work up front to actually add the right version but it will protect you from breaking your cluster in an unexpected way in the future. Uh, the next thing people ask about, because Docker Hub is doing that commonly, is you have a major version or you have a minor version. And you basically say, like, give me version 6. Like, whatever is the latest version within 6, I don't really care about it, because, well, there should not be any breaking changes. Just give me whatever is in 6 um, or in 6.5. Are we doing that? Anybody remembers? Are we doing it? OK. Uh, no, we don't. Because this is, for Elasticsearch at least, it's a very bad idea. Because Lucene is pretty picky. So Lucene is the base library that we use for writing to disk, and which does the search and everything. Lucene is pretty picky. Once you create something with, with a Lucene index, or like the, the Lucene version that is in Elasticsearch 6.5, and you want to put that on a node with an older Lucene version, it will not move the data there. Because it will only always write to the current version, but it will never like mix with older versions. So you should never move or mix clusters with minor ver or even patch level versions because unexpected stuff might happen. Um, and that's why we don't support that. So you will need to explicitly define exactly the version you want. And when you upgrade, you will need to say, I want to go to explicitly that version. Um, and then there is this other thing. What's even in a tag? Because you can see this is version 5.3.3, and it was released some month ago. And one of them is four months old, and others are five months old. But we always release our products on the same day. What happened there? Why are those different dates? Sorry? No, no. Um, what happened was basically we had a bug just in the Docker image. So 5.3.3, the version was okay, but we have had a bug the way we built our Docker image. And then we just pushed out a new version, but with the same version tag. So you basically need to look at the ID of the image to figure out if you have the old or the new version. So at the moment, we are simply overwriting Docker tags whenever we need to push out the new version. Um, so yeah, right now we're overwriting it, and we do have versioning. So these are all the labels you would get when you get one of our images. And you can see, for example, there's the version and where to get it from and the license and everything. But there is no image version. So once we release version 6.5.2, for example, and we need to push out an update, we would simply again overwrite the tag. And we will also not provide like security updates for older versions, um, because suddenly you realize it's not just your software that is in there, because previously you had a security issue in your software, you pushed out a new version, you move on. But with the Docker images, suddenly you have a full load of other dependencies. You have the base image and the JVM are suddenly in your dependencies. And we might need to kind of like, for example, we have images 5.6 is still supported. And we might to occasionally update that I container because there is a security issue in the base image. Are we doing that? Right now, no. Right now, we will only release new images with security updates of the base image when there is a new Elasticsearch version. We might change it and also version those in the future. But right now, once a, an image is released, and unless there is really a bug on our side, we will not re-release that image. Um, 
But in the future, we might add like a Docker image version. So we might have 6.5.2 uh, um, underscore 1, 2, whatever, depending on which version of the Docker image we push out. We don't have that yet. We're still unsure if we want that. Uh, but maybe we will do that in the future. Next up, security and stability. Um, can you run Elasticsearch as root? Has anybody tried that? Yes. Is it possible? No, it's not possible. Because we think it's a really bad idea. And sometimes people say, like, but I really want to. And your only option to do that is actually take the source code. find Because basically, we when, when we start up Elasticsearch, we will check the user. And if it's root, then we will do a system exit. Your only way to work around that is to fork the source code and comment out the system exit. There is no other workaround for that. And we think this is the right way to approach that. Um, and this is one of the ideas I call the cockroaches. Um, because people accepted that you shouldn't run a server process as root for a long time. However, with Docker, suddenly that idea that people want to run stuff as root is reappearing. Because people are saying, well, we run everything as root in Docker because it's inside a container and, well, security, fuck it. Um, we, we just want to run everything as root. And we're always like, yeah, but we're not supporting that. Um, you cannot do that. Um, and then there's one other thing that we run into every now and then. We have these two modes in Elasticsearch. We call something a development mode if it's only bound to local interfaces. Then we assume you're in development. You're not a production system. You cannot form a cluster. You cannot query a remote or it cannot query it from remote. Then it's a development system and we will be like more lenient about some things. Whereas if you are binding to external network interfaces and you could form a cluster or some external service could query Elasticsearch, then we assume you're in production. And in production, pr production we have something called um, bootstrap checks, where we basically make sure you're do doing s not doing stuff that we know will break in the long run. Like we will make sure you're not running on a JVM version where we know there, is, there are bugs that might corrupt your data, or we will check for the number of file handles, so we will make sure you're kind of in a production-ready setup to, well, fix that early on and not have the problems later. That's kind of the general idea. And the problem is, what do you do with Docker? As soon as you spin up Docker, you need to bind to a non-local host interface so that you get out of the container. So do we force everybody to be in a production mode for Docker? No, we actually have a specific Docker mode. Um, it's called discovery type single node, where you can bind to non-local host interfaces, but you cannot cluster. And that's the way to get out of the Docker image uh, and avoid any issues around that. Uh, but the bootstrap checks are generally here to stay. So there is no way to form a cluster and disable the bootstrap checks. Like It's like 15 or 20 things or so that we check, and they will just make sure that in production you will avoid the really stupid mistakes. Um, also, what we did change, like initially, we did have default credentials, but in 6.5 there are no more default credentials, which is always kind of interesting because setting up the images is kind of harder if you cannot rely on default uh, credentials. And you need to configure everything when you start up the container. Um, also, if you're using our commercial security features and you're using them with a production license, you will need to enable TLS. And generating certificates and mounting them into containers is always a pain in the ass. And we know that it's kind of hard, but we still require you to do that. And then there's the final thing that everybody, or not everybody, but a lot of people complain about the run into, that the container runs as the Elasticsearch user with that user ID and group ID. And it's well documented, but we get at least one ticket a month where somebody says, like, um, starting with those new images that you're providing, we cannot just use our old data anymore because the user permissions are wrong. Or we kind of like do whatever with the user permissions. And what we especially like if people file such an issue and then they say like, um, I prefer a simple fire and forget container, which we're always assuming our images are made for production use as well. And fire and forget is not really what you want to do with your data. Like this is just not a compatible approach. Uh, because if you want to do stuff like that, um, yeah. This is not what we are doing with our images. It's not kind of the YOLO approach. Whatever you throw in, it will just try to do something. Um, you will need to set up the permissions correctly. So don't mutate the bind mount. Um, the old images by Docker Inc. were doing that. So they were basically going into the bind mounted directory and changing the permissions on the bind mounted directory on the host. And we think that is a really bad practice because your Docker image should never change anything on the host. So we will not automatically change those permissions. You will need to set 
those up correctly. Um, yeah, and the quote we always have internally, people assume they don't need to know anything about file permissions anymore or about Unix in general. Unfortunately, Docker kind of forces you to still know these things and if you don't know them, you will have a very hard time with Docker because stuff just doesn't behave the way you expect it to, expe uh, to, to behave. And you will need to create the right permissions. For example, does anybody know the, the Docker defaults for the number of open files and the number of processes you can run in your images? Which might be relevant. Yeah, it, it really depends because um, it was changed in 2016 and then they changed it to infinity. And you can actually check that. But these are like things you, before you go to production, you should really check out like what are, what are my file handles? What are the open, uh, or what are the processes you can run? Um, so if you just run our base image uh, and run uh, the U limits, you can see um, what the limits are. And that's also a nice way to check like what are really the limits of what you're trying to put into production. Or what is the virtual memory? What is the setting for that? That one actually depends on the host. And depending on your operating system, or for me on my Mac, these are the settings that will be applied. But these are things you just need to check before going to production for your images. Um, because otherwise what we often see is people don't know Elasticsearch and people don't know Docker and then they th think we will combine both of them and then it will just magically work and everything will be much better. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of the opposite that you don't know either system and then it's just chaos and despair. And I think at least 50% of the issues that we have on our GitHub organization for the Elastic Docker images um, are actually Docker support. And well, we're not too keen on doing Docker support on the side, but I guess we will have to for some time. Uh, and the final thing is that Docker is kind of a le leaky abstraction. So you always think, well, it's inside the container and everything is good. However, every now and then we have like specific things where on this host operating system or with this file system, then suddenly um, only there you have some issues. Um, so for example, we had issues which you could only uh, reproduce on Windows hosts which is always stupid for us because nobody uses Windows on a regular basis on the team. Um, or at least not the team involved in building those images. But yeah, debugging those are always fun. Um, okay, customization. How do you um, customize Docker images? Every now and then we get feature requests like this, where somebody says like, okay, I take the image, when it starts up, I will just run a random shell script and do stuff. Who thinks this is a good idea? Yeah, we, we don't really like that because we really like the immutability of images that once you create the image, that is what you will get. You don't just run random shell scripts or set environment variables and stuff magically happens for production. Um, but it should be really baked into the image. So how to, um, how to c do customization then? Because we don't allow any runtime mutation by default. Um, so for example, well, if you need to customize the Docker image itself, just use a Docker file. Basically, you have from whatever image you have. Here we are installing a phonetic plugin. Here we are installing a third-party plugin. Basically, it's just installing whatever, building a new image. If you want to use that across your cluster, just push it to your registry and then use that image everywhere. Don't do that at runtime when you start the image for the first time. This is not reproducible and it's not giving you good results. Um, for example, if you want to use um, key stores to keep secrets in your image, how would you do that? Because sometimes people think, oh, I need to bake those in. But you don't actually bake in like key stores or certificates into the image. You can always bind mount them. So what that looks like is something like this. We, we start one image uh, or one instance of a container with a single node. So here, this is the exactly the node type where you can access that uh, container. We SSH into it. In the container, we run the key store create. We create the key store on a bind mounted fol folder. So you can see this config folder is mounted to my laptop. Uh, we create that key store, we exit the container, and then there is still the key store file. And basically what you do is you create the key store file once, and then you would mount it into every container where you run it and need those credentials. And the same goes for certificates or any other files. Like, you can just bind mount the directories into the container to make use of them. No point in baking those in. Um, and then, for example, here to use that key store with Docker Compose, but could be Kubernetes or whatever, um, you basically 
use the same image, and then you just say, okay, here are my secrets, this is my key store, this is where the secrets should be coming from. And this is the right way to do it and not do some mutation when you start the container up. Okay, orchestration-wise, who is using Kubernetes? Okay, who is using Swarm? Okay, two. Uh, Mesos? No, okay. Nomad or anything else? Yeah, that, that's what we typically see. It's not that much. Um, so we don't really have orchestration yet. Um, and we also had our fair share of issues with orchestration. So for example, up until Kubernetes 1.8, they did not allow dots in environment variables. Unfortunately, the way we configure everything, we require dots in environment variables. And this was only added in 1.8 in Kubernetes. But like officially, there is no reason why dots should not be allowed in environment variables. It was something very random that Kubernetes did, which they do every now and then. Um, so if you're on 1.8, your life will be much easier because you don't need to do weird escaping or hex around that. Also, people from the community tried to provide Kubernetes integrations. Um, so this was at least the most widely used thing to run Elasticsearch on Kubernetes. But the uh, author stopped doing that if, like a month ago or so um, because he doesn't want to. But we'll try to take over because as you can see, this is still a private repository as of today, but I think we will open this up in one week or so, or in two weeks, um, where we'll have a Helm chart for Elasticsearch and Kibana. So if you need Helm charts, wait one more week and we will provide something official. I mean, it will be a better initially, will take some time to bake and be production ready, I guess, but there will be a Helm chart. I think we will announce it at KubeCon, which is next week. Um, that's the plan. Um, but yeah, Kubernetes is always fun. Um, the question is always, should you really run databases or measures queues or whatever on Kubernetes? And the other thing is we also have our own orchestration tool, which we call the Elastic Cloud Enterprise, which is basically providing you a UI and can set up clusters any way you want, and it does all the orchestration in the background. However, we started that before Kubernetes was so popular, so we kind of built our own orchestration suite. Um, Probably we'll integrate with Kubernetes in the future because that's where everybody is going and there's no way around it. Okay, to wrap up, when people are saying Docker is disrupting the industry, I'm never sure if it's kind of a good or a bad way because all the stuff that I see with people failing around Docker or shooting down production systems, I'm never sure where we are going. Um, people often ask, can I run, um, or can I run Elasticsearch on Docker? Yes, you can. The actual question, I think, is should you run Elasticsearch on Docker? What do you think is the right answer? Yes, it depends. It's all when you're a consultant, that's always the answer you give. It depends. And then you can charge a lot of money afterwards. Um, that's kind of the thing. But for us, it's always like if you have everything on containers and you know how to operate containers well, do it. If you don't know containers that well, probably don't start with your stateful databases or data stores to work with Docker, because otherwise your life might be very hard later on. Um, and yeah, depending on where you stand, like Kelsey Hightower, he's the main developer advocate or the best known developer advocate from Google for Kubernetes. Even he's always a bit skeptical if you should run your stateful things in Kubernetes. You can know what you're doing, um, otherwise you might have a bad experience. And to finish off, what do you get when you run the following docker pull commands? So if you run docker pull elastic elastic search, what are you getting? Exactly. Um, this one will result in an error because we don't have latest. This is also like we get a GitHub issue every other week or so for that, but yes, this it's kind of obvious because we think it's a really bad practice for latest. Uh, people just expect it from Docker Hub. If you do docker pull log slash alpine, what will you get? Yes, exactly. You will get the very old image that Docker Inc. provided because they were using the, uh, the alpine images and then you will get, I think it's also stuck on five something. Um, when you run docker pull metric beat 652, this is unfortunately a tricky one. This one will fail because 
on the direct access without the user, we only have Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. But the beats are not available like that. You will need to use this. So there, it's under our user Docker pull Elastic Metric Beat 562. Or you can go to our registry because, well, everything is available on our registry as well. Just not the old Alpine or Docker Inc. built images. So this is what you're getting. Any questions? And we're in good time for lunch, I think. Yes, please. Uh, wait, I think you will be getting a microphone. When you're showing uh, one the of the first slides, you have, uh, I have seen uh, the command, the Docker pool, and you specify the version, and also sp you specify the uh, SHA of the image. Yes. And, and you mentioned that you sometimes, when you have some bugs, you can, uh, pu uh, you can push another image with the same tag version. And what happens if I specify the SHA of the old version and uh, the new version is uh, pu pushed to registry? What what will happen? It will fail. I, my I'm, my I'm thinking since we are replacing the tag, probably it's not available anymore. Then it would pr I would assume it will fail. We haven't done that in a long time. I think we had one or two cases where we did it like more than a year ago. So I haven't really seen a scenario recently. Um, hopefully the images are stable enough that we don't have to do that on a frequent basis. But I would assume it will fail if the 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 ID is not there anymore. Because basically we overwrite the tag and I think we will kill the old image. Okay, thank you. I, I assume. Hopefully it's not necessary. Hi. Uh, which uh, solution do you use for internal Docker registry? Um, Can you say that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, something that we will probably change in the future because I know it was started two years ago by somebody who is doing a different position and it was forked and has some internal fixes. Um, uh, I don't think it's anything that you want to use anymore. I think that th things have changed enough um, that you don't want to do it. Um, so the, the general idea that we have is that all the artifacts that we have, any download that you get, based or from us is always backed by S3 because we don't want to have like any other download solutions. And then we have a proxy in front of it and basically there is a proxy that does S3 support, but at least the version we took was super old. Um, I don't think it's anything you want to, to use. I think Google is providing a new registry from what I read and we're generally going more and more with more and more stuff to Google and we will from what I know, we're evaluating if we want to move our artifacts to the Google store for any, any binaries in the future. No decisions yet. Um, right now, everything is still backed by Amazon S3, and that's where the download will come from. Uh, but I'm not sure it's like a good solution, and I would point to that. I, I would need to search for five minutes or so to find uh, wha what registry it was. It was a rather obscure one with, um, I don't think it's something you would want to use. Um, probably Thank you, you want to use something like JFrog Artifactory or something like that, um, which might be more general use case. Here, there. You could have kept the microphone. Okay, another question. Uh, for example, in my, on my, pro my current project, we use Docker images uh, uh, to release everything and on every branch build, we have new Docker image that is pushed to our local registry. And time to time, uh, uh, once, uh, once per three months, uh, we got uh, registry full of images. And uh, th there is, uh, we try to find out the good way to clean up the registry, but they have links to each other. So cleaning up registry is uh, became a very hard problem. And what we do every three months, we kill our registry and set up it again. And maybe you have like better approach uh, to give me advice how to solve this problem. Thank you. Mm. Um, you're in a very different position to us because we cannot really do that because people kind of depend on a specific version so we can never get rid of that. that otherwise, people would get very unhappy. I know that deleting stuff from our registry since it's backed by a three is also a complicated task. Like you need to correlate some SHAs and then you need to remove the right buckets with the right SHAs. So I, I know that it's a pain. But since for us, 
it's everything is official, we cannot really take anything away, so we don't have a good solution for that. Um, doesn't like Nexus, for example, provide a mechanism for that, but if everything is interlinked, it might be hard to, to keep the entire dependency tree. But I think like the, the good binary syncs that keep that can actually take care of stuff. Um, so especially if you always have like something that moves very quickly, you can just get rid of old versions. Unless you need that old version somewhere. So I'm not sure if there's a good way to automate that process. Um, but it, it might depend. Um, it's an interesting approach to kill the entire registry every three months. Um, but it's, I, I like the pragmatic nature of that. Um, it just cleans up and you start fresh. Um, with the immutability uh, idea and everything, I mean, that, that's actually not a bad idea. It's kind of nice. Um, but I, I don't think I have a great solution for you for that, sorry. I think back there, hi. Yeah. Hi, Philip. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the speech. And uh, you mentioned that uh, you will uh, present the Helm charts on uh, Kubicon yes. uh, next week. But uh, what about the operator? Because uh, before we have an uh, AppMC operator for now, but it's not trivial to uh, upgra upgrade for the 6.5, uh, for example. And it's, uh, you know, uh, just the uh, current version. So what is your plan? Thanks. Yes, so um, the thing is, operators are a lot of work to write and a lot of work to get right. So for now, we will start off with the Helm chart um, because it's much simpler and it's a starting point. Also, um, since we have our own orchestration tool, um, dum 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 dum, where was it? Uh, since we have our own orchestration tool, um, I'm not sure maybe the operator will be a commercial thing in the future. I'm not sure. Um, the Helm chart might be a good solution to get started, but yes, uh, like all the upgrade scenarios and paths are much more limited, but maybe that's something we want to monetize. I'm not sure. I don't think we have a final solution for that. So for now, the, the current state will be, we provide the official Docker images, we provide the Helm chart, but any higher level orchestration around that is basically an Elastic Cloud. And Elastic Cloud will potentially add Kubernetes support as well in the future. I'm not sure if they're decided how to build it, but maybe with an operator. But then it's kind of like, which operator is free and which operator is commercial? Probably operators will just be a commercial thing. I'm not sure, this is like not an official decision we have yet. It's just my gut feeling that this might be a business thing where it might make sense. So to get started with Helm, that's for free to get you up and running. But if you need higher level uh, integration or upgrade scenarios, that might be something that you could monetize. Maybe, I'm not sure. I hope that makes sense. It's probably not the answer you wanted, but you know, I, I want my salary to be paid as well. So, so we need to get that somewhere. Okay, if you have more questions, just come to me afterwards. Enjoy lunch. We still have a couple of stickers here. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>